We are back again in Jacksonville, with more on the Fulio Crash Out Assassin's Trial. Alicia Andrews is turning on everyone. Saying Isaiah, also known as Gouda, was abusing her, and that Fulio's own people's backdoored him. It's crazy, let's get into it. The murder of Fulio, a well-known figure in the Jacksonville rap scene, has turned into a highly complicated legal case, with multiple defendants now pointing fingers at one another during the trial. The case took a pivotal turn when Alicia Andrews' defense team filed a motion to compel further investigation shedding light on potential gaps in the original investigation, and arguing that law enforcement failed to explore critical leads that could change the trajectory of the case. At the heart of this motion is the argument that the prosecution focused too narrowly on Andrews and her co-defendants, ignoring other possible suspects who were with the victim on the night of the incident and traveled with him from Jacksonville to Tampa. One of the primary arguments in Andrews' defense is that several key witnesses, many of whom had close ties to the victim, gave inconsistent or contradictory statements during interviews with police. Despite these inconsistencies, law enforcement failed to conduct follow-up interviews or scrutinize these individuals further. These witnesses included people who had traveled with the victim from Jacksonville to Tampa and were with him at the time of his death, yet they were not treated as serious suspects. This failure, according to the defense, suggests a significant oversight in the investigation that could have led law enforcement to ignore crucial evidence. The defense's motion also highlights how the victim had publicly expressed fear and distrust of people close to him in the weeks leading up to his murder. On social media, the victim posted about feeling unsafe and betrayed, going so far as to label his own generation as untrustworthy. He also expressed fear of being backstabbed by those in his inner circle, adding further suspicion that others, not just Andrews, may have been involved in his death. The defense argues that these statements, paired with posthumous music releases that reference these fears, were not properly considered by the police. This atmosphere of mistrust, betrayal, and possible grudges within the victim's close group should have been a focal point in, in the investigation, expanding the pool of suspects beyond just Andrews and her co-defendants. Exclusion would be if there are, if FDLE is still conducting testing of any evidence, it's just, you just need to let the defense counsel know that I don't have this FDLE report or whatever it may be because they're, they're still testing. But all outstanding reports need to be, um, you need to have them by the 27th and then they need to be produced to the defense by October 1st. Okay. Okay. So um, let's deal with Ms. Andrews then. So state and Ms. Hurdle, January 6th for trial. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. And we will set a pre-trial conference, which will be a status for everybody, but it will be a pre-trial conference. Um, December the 19th at 10 a.m. Your Honor? Yep. If I may, I just want to notate or remind the court because we see I'm, I'm new to this from first appearance. My client actually is pregnant. So that's another reason why there's certain decisions. When is she due? She's due February 15th, 16th. Okay. So just uh, for the record. Thank you. Noted. Okay. Um, so then. Let's look at our calendars for a trial date for the remaining defendants, all right? Because the the biggest issue in a case like this with four separate defense attorneys are the schedules of the defense attorneys and the state. So um, Ms. Rayner is out of pocket most of the spring, correct? Correct. For her legislative commitments. Um, so we're looking at late 25, early 26.
Judge, and I would prefer October of 2025 if the defense counsel could be ready by then. Judge Brock is also on behalf of Mr. Murphy. Judge, I have State versus Zavante Sampson, which is a 2021 case, and it is just going to trial division now from Division I. And the court just got all of our respective dates. It's a five defendant case. And it appears that September of 2025 is when that case is going to be set. Um, although there may be severances, there'll be at least three, if not four of those defendants that will be tried together. I also have State versus Josue Claval, which is a death penalty case. It is also a 2022 case. And I anticipate that being tried in mid to late 2025. Well, have you, have they, is that judge set a trial date yet? That's not set. That's not set. That's what the calendar lawyers have provided to the court. I understand. I would request early 2026. Oh, well, because then I don't want it, because then this is the problem that we're going to run into. We're going to run into the same legislative um, conflict for Ms. Rayner. So it's got to be 2025 in the fall, October, November, December. Um, Your Honor, if we were going to try this in 2025, it would be uh, preferable for me um, either in uh, November or December. Um, I will be in committee weeks, and I know that legislative session uh, for 2026 goes from January to about um, March, uh, in the very, the very beginning of March. Um, so I, if we were to go into 2026, I could do mid-March or April 2026. Um, I don't have the the, the committee dates for uh, 2025. Well, we so. can assume it's going to be th it's similar this right. year, correct? So the committee dates in 2025. Uh, and uh, it precedes the legislative session, correct? correct? So, so the committee is usually in 2025 are October. There's one in October, a sprinkling in uh, November and the rest in December. And then we go into legislative session, probably that second week uh, of January. And then we are done in uh, the first week of March, 2026, um, because it's an off cycle election year. Um, I don't, obviously I don't have those dates, but those are kind of what it historically has. Right. So hence my comment that the spring is normally no good for Ms. Rayner. So I guess I have a question for you. Just um, if the state seeks the death penalty against one or more defendants, would everyone remaining be tried together or would the death penalty defendants have to be severed out? Judge, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. I'd have to research that. If the death penalty wasn't on the table, I knew that our strategy was to try them all together. We didn't believe that there was any motion to sever I have not looked at, and I'll have to talk to Mr. Foreman to discuss whether or not that position will change if we file notice on some of the defense. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick a trial date late 2025 for any defendants um, who've waived speedy trial where the state is not seeking the death penalty. Because I honestly, my gut instinct is you can't try them together. That's my gut. Um, I could be wrong, but that's my gut instinct. So we're going to pick a date, and then and we're also going to pick a date 26 for any defendants where the state is seeking the death penalty. Okay. So um, I'm going to preliminarily set aside two weeks. Um, December. You guys want to start the December 1st, the Monday after Thanksgiving? Fine, you're uh, 2025. Yes. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> it's not 2026. We're not going to go that far into 2026 in the same soup. Um, okay. So, and I would anticipate December 1st, 2025. And assuming we have three co-defendants where the state is not seeking death, we should be able to get this case tried in two weeks, including jury selection, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's our prospective trial date. Please block out your calendars with any other judges for those dates. Then looking at 2026, any defendants who are facing the death penalty. Um, mine was 
the legislative session is normally done by The abusive relationship between Alicia Andrews and one of her co-defendants is another critical point raised by the defense. According to the motion, Andrews was in a toxic, physically, and emotionally abusive relationship with one of the key individuals in the case. But this dynamic was never fully explored by investigators. The defense argues that Andrews' actions on the night of the incident were likely influenced by her partner's manipulation, fear, and control, raising the possibility that she was coerced or acting under duress. Despite this abusive relationship being a known fact to law enforcement, it was not examined in depth, leading to a one-sided narrative that paints Andrews as a willing participant rather than a victim of manipulation. Further complicating the case are the discrepancies in the timeline of events and the movements of the vehicles involved. The prosecution's theory is that Andrews and her co-defendants were following the victim on the night of his murder. However, surveillance footage reportedly contradicts this claim. According to the defense, video evidence shows that the victim and his friends arrived at the location several minutes before any of the defendants were even nearby, and that Andrews' vehicle was parked in a different location for some time before the alleged perpetrators arrived. In fact, a witness stated that the victim was not being followed at all, casting doubt on the state's theory of a continuous pursuit. If the decision to go to the final location was made spontaneously, as evidence suggests, then it would have been nearly impossible for Andrews to have known the victim's exact whereabouts at the time of the crime. The behavior of other witnesses also raises questions about their possible involvement. Several individuals, including those associated with the alias Fulio, were present at the scene and gave conflicting statements during their brief interviews with law enforcement. The defense points out that some of these individuals were caught lying but were not pressed further or treated as suspects. Their proximity to the victim during critical moments of the night and their conflicting statements suggest they may have more involvement than initially considered. Despite these red flags, law enforcement chose not to pursue further questioning or additional investigation into these individuals. Moreover, the victim's social media activity prior to the murder contained public warnings from individuals threatening him if he attended certain events. Despite these clear threats of harm, law enforcement overlooked this evidence and instead concentrated on Andrews and her co-defendants, ignoring other individuals who had both the motive and opportunity to commit the crime. This tunnel vision in the investigation is another major point of contention in the defense's motion, suggesting that the police may have missed critical evidence that could point to other suspects. Finally, the defense criticizes how law enforcement portrayed the case to the media. The narrative presented focused almost exclusively on the five individuals who were arrested, while ignoring the larger context of who was with the victim at the time of the incident, and those who had traveled from Jacksonville to Tampa that weekend. This selective portrayal of the case has contributed to a one-sided view in the public eye, reinforcing the idea that Andrews and her co-defendants are solely responsible for the crime, without considering alternative theories or additional suspects. In light of these unresolved issues, the defense has requested that the court order further investigation into several key areas. Specifically, they ask for a closer examination of individuals who traveled with the victim from Jacksonville. The abusive relationship between Andrews and her co-defendant the timeline of vehicle movements on the night of the murder, and the inconsistent statements and suspicious behavior of witnesses who were close to the victim. The defense argues that these areas of inquiry could provide exculpatory evidence, potentially shifting the focus away from Andrews and revealing the true dynamics that led to the victim's death. By bringing these issues to light, the defense paints a picture of an incomplete investigation one that may have missed key details that could exonerate Alicia Andrews or implicate other individuals who have, thus far, avoided serious scrutiny.
As the trial unfolds, the tension between the defendants continues to grow, with co-defendants turning on each other, further complicating the case. Andrew's defense team is now pushing for a broader investigation, one that they believe will reveal new evidence and possibly change the entire outcome of the trial. Stay locked in with Real Appas and subscribed from the latest in the trenches. Stay dangerous.